before we start. Um, firstly, you will notice that um, for those of you who are familiar with Zoom, you're very often able to raise your hand and ask a question or sometimes even unmute yourself. For the purpose of this webinar, we've actually muted you and the hand raising option isn't available. But what is available for you is if you scroll into your um, usual cursor um, to either go to the bottom or the top of your screen, it depends on the version you have, you'll see that there's a section that says Q and A. What you'll be able to do is type in any questions that you have throughout the presentation and then at the end of the presentation I'll go through those questions and in the time that's allowed I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't get to them then uh, my email details will be there and you'll be able to email me directly and I'll do my best to answer. So I'm very excited to be able to give in this presentation. I'm normally used to be sitting in front of a large audience so this is quite unusual for me not to be able to see the people in front of me. So the presentation that we're doing today, Animals Camera Action, Using Camera Traps to Save Lives and my name is Wendy Coninson. Now usually when I give a presentation I often ask lots of questions and like to engage with my audience now, obviously, that's not possible. However, I am still going to ask questions. And even though you can't answer me, I want you to try and answer, answer the question in your head. Or if you've got someone sat next to you, you can turn to them and answer each other. And just to get you a little bit of morning exercise, if I say, put your hand up, to answer the question, you could also do that, even though I won't be able to hear you. So let's get on with the presentation. So I'd like to start with just introducing um, you to who I am. Some of you will know me, but many of you who have tuned in to the EWT webinars won't have a clue who I am. So I think many of you can tell by my accent that I am British by birth, but I live and work in South Africa. My background is originally in physical education and in the United Kingdom, I actually spent 15 years teaching in a high school physical education and I loved it. But there came a point in my life where I wanted to have a change of career. So I left all my family in the UK and had the intention of coming to South Africa just initially for three months where I started volunteering on a program in the Northern Limpopo with the Endangered Wildlife Trust, um, assisting other researchers with some carnivore research. And despite only supposed to being here for three months, that three months actually turned into 15 years. And I then married a South African and we live uh, fairly north in South Africa, for those of you who are familiar with the country, about 100 kilometers south of the border between South Africa and Zimbabwe, and Botswana in a beautiful area of the country called the Sopensberg. So, how did I get into the field that I'm doing now? So whilst I was working on a research project where we were studying large carnivores in the northern part of Limpopo, I started to notice a number of dead animals on the road. And I started to whilst I was driving the roads, recording this information, and as horrific as some of the cases were, I started to realize that it was quite a big problem 
And I must admit, I was very naive at the time, not realizing that it was a global problem and not something that was just specific to South Africa. And this then led me to do a further degree in my, for my master's, which I studied through Rhodes University and Swanee University of Technology. And this was based on looking at the number of roadkill in one particular area of the country and the reasons why roadkill happens. Does it happen because it's close to a water source or is there poor fencing by the roadside? What season is it? So there were various things that we looked at. So that was how I got started, never actually believing that it would lead to greater things. And this was almost 10 years ago. And this was also through the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Since we realized that it was a greater problem than just the area that I was working, the Endangered Wildlife Trust decided to develop what we now know as the Wildlife and Transport Programme. And this involved trying to understand what the, imp the impacts of transport had on wildlife. And when we talk about trans transport, we mean roads, railways, ships, and also aircraft. So what do we need or why do we need transport? Now, this is a question that I'm asking you so you can answer in your head or turn to the person next to you. So why do we need it? So we have cars or vehicles on roads. Why do we need the roads, railways, aircraft, large trucks, and also shipping? And I've shown a picture here of a container, but we also have cruise ships as well. So I think the answer is fairly obvious, isn't it? It's about developing our economies and the transfer of goods and people. And obviously, the more efficient a transport system is, the more we can actually enjoy excursions, so holidays, and also many, many goods that so many of us take for granted. However, a lot of these transport systems do have negative consequences for our wildlife. And that's not just in South Africa, but this is across the world. So there are two types of impacts. Some of them are more obvious than others, and that's why I call them direct. And then there are the other impacts which are more indirect. So just have a little think here about what I might mean by a most obvious impact and something that's very, very visual and often upsetting for many of us. A direct impact is a collision. So look at this aircraft here where you've got all these birds flying towards the aircraft. Can you imagine the impact that that has on that plane as it takes off? and any of those birds that then fly into those jet engines. And then, yes, it's a very, very sad image here, but wildlife that attempt to cross the road, often resulting in a direct collision with that vehicle and the animal dying on the road. So these are your direct impacts. Now the indirect impacts are less obvious to us and something that maybe we don't even think about. So you've got emission fumes. So the carbon dioxide that comes out of vehicles often impact our habitat. Many plants are affected and die, and even a lot of animals that reside by roads will either die or move away from the roads. Roads also act as barriers. So very often an animal will either try and cross the road or it's too scared to, and effectively that road or railway would act as a barrier between that animal crossing from one side of the road to another. And this is what I find most interesting. Even though it's an indirect impact, some animals have actually evolved 
that, and changed their behaviour in reaction to particularly vehicles on roads. I'm showing you this image of a frog. And we know very often that the way frogs breed or start to breed is they have a call or a croak that they do to attract mates. And if we imagine that you have lots and lots of traffic and it's very noisy, very often these mating calls you can't hear or the other frogs can't hear. So some frogs have actually evolved and changed their breeding calls to compete with traffic so they can still actually mate. So even though that's a negative consequence, it does show that nature is very clever and often competes with our transport systems. And as I've said with the direct impact, the most obvious impact of transportation, particularly on roads, is what we call roadkill. And the consequences for us as human beings, well, if you, in your vehicle, drive into a large animal, that can have serious consequences for you. Beside damage to the vehicle, you may be injured or tragically killed. And if you think about the insurance costs for that, approximately 1.5 billion rand is spent on accident insurance claims in South Africa. That's a significant amount of money for us, just through colliding with an animal on the road. So this is where I ask you a question and you get to do your morning exercise. How many of you have been in a car when you have hit an animal on the road? I just want you to put your hand up. And even though I can't see you, oh, I see a couple of people are actually raising their hands here. Okay, so I don't know how many people have put your hands up, but I'm assuming that when I say you've been in a car when an animal's been hit, we're talking maybe a collision with a large animal. So maybe your vehicle was damaged, maybe you were injured. Now, I think there's a few of you out there who haven't put your hands up. So just have a little bit more of a think. What about a small snake? What about a frog? What about insects? Butterflies? That's all wildlife. And whilst it might not cause any damage to your vehicle, and you might not even acknowledge it as a road kill, it still is. And if we put it into the context of endangered species of butterfly that happen to be migrating from one direction to another, and they have to cross the road, think about how many of those butterflies would actually be hit on your windscreen and die. That could seriously impact a population. So whether you know it or not, quite possibly all of you have been in the car either as a driver or a passenger when you've been involved in a collision. So just to answer that, ask that question again, how many of you have been in a car when wildlife has been hit? Raise your hand. I hope everybody has got their hand up in the air. So let's just put it into perspective. Worldwide, 750 million vehicles are on our road and approximately 50 million kilometers of public road exist. Now that's very, very difficult to get our heads around and often meaningless figures. So let's try and put it into perspective. 50 million kilometers of public road is approximately driving 2,200 times around the equator. You definitely need an awful lot of fuel to do that. So that's how many roads are actually on the planet. That's a lot, hey? So one of the things that we're doing at the Endangered Wildlife Trust and the Wildlife and Transport Programme 
is trying to understand exactly where roadkill is happening and why. I mean, let's face it, it's impossible to drive every single road in the country and record every single dead animal. It's, it's physically not possible. And this is also on a global scale. So that's where you as members of the public or researchers or whatever field you work in are incredibly valuable in helping us understand the problem. So often we ask experts to undertake roadkill surveys for us as well as volunteers and send us information about all roadkill that you see on the roads. So one of the things we're actually doing to actually ensure that some of the data and information that we receive is very robust is that we actually partner with three of South Africa's toll companies. You may be familiar with many of these. There's N3, Bequena, and Track. And what we do is we train these route patrol teams that are already driving the roads. And very often, if there's a truck that turns over, these will be the guys that are there to assist. Maybe if you break down on the road, they will be there to assist them. And in addition to their duties, we have trained them to identify dead animals on the road and record it, and it all gets sent through to us. And as members of the public, you can also help us with this information. We actually have a cell phone app called Road Watch where you can send through the information. We have emails that you can send us information, or you can even use social media. So over the years, we've managed to build up a picture of where roadkill numbers reported, and I emphasize reports because it is just something that's sent to us rather than actually specific information that's done by a qualified researcher. This is what the reports look like. Now you'll see some of the very, very dark areas, like I've got my mouse here, this is the N3 highway. So you would expect it to have lots and lots of roadkill on it because it's the route patrollers that are reporting this information. If we look over to the left of our screen, this is the Western and Northern Cape. There's very, very little data, but it doesn't actually mean that there's no roadkill happening over there. It just happens to be a very, very remote part of the country. So we receive less reports. However, what this does provide us with is a snapshot of what's actually happening. So it allows us to make decisions about what we do with this information. So as I highlighted just now, this is the N3 highway that goes from Johannesburg out to the coast in, and the port of Durban. And what we can start to do is identify what we call road ho roadkill hotspots. Now you'll see this map I've turned into what we call a heat map. And those areas that are marked in red are the areas where roadkill numbers are highest in reporting. Notice I keep using this term reporting because it is the route patrollers that send us the information and of course there may be things that they miss. And the outcomes of animals crossing these roads is that they will cross the road and ultimately die. Some animals will actually avoid the road altogether so because highways or motorways, as they're known in other countries, have lots of traffic on them and they're very, very noisy, some animals will actually go up to the road and then because of the noise and the amount of traffic, they actually turn around and go back. 
So this goes back to the whole thing that I said earlier about roads being barriers. And then some animals will look for other options. And this is where it gets exciting. This is what I'm going to explore now with what these other options are. So why cross the road in the first place? Why did these animals want to take and risk their lives to get from one side to the other? Well, if we think about it, the animals were there first. It's us that have put up the transport systems after the animals were already there. So they will naturally want to use their home range or territory and continue business as normal. And part of their home range and territory often includes a transport network such as a road. Animals naturally migrate. And this is often to do with food and water sources as they move from one part of a country to another. And obviously to breed. Populations don't necessarily decide to all live on the same side of the road. This goes back to the part of the home range and their territory. So when they want to breed, some of them have to get across that road to go and find their mate. And this is often to their demise. Now this shows a number of animals using the road to cross. And it could be for any of those reasons that I've listed just now. It may be because it's part of their home range or they're actually going across looking for their mate or it's food sources. And these animals, as you can see, are from many, many countries in the world. You'll see one of the top figures in the middle, it shows bears. Well, we don't have bears in South Africa. And in the middle at the bottom, a kangaroo. We don't have kangaroos here. So roads all over the world potentially create problems. And I think it's probably important that we actually address creating a barrier because whilst roads actually create barriers for wildlife, many of us are in a barrier situation at the moment. Certainly here in South Africa, where we're in a lockdown period, we have to not only maintain social distancing, but we are supposed to stay in our houses and only go out for essential items. So effectively, the COVID-19 is creating barriers for us. So that's how I want you to think of roads and how it affects populations, how you can no longer go and do the things that you would naturally want to do. And therefore, there are some synergies, some parallels between the wildlife world and what's happening with human beings. So, what can we do? Because this is quite a major problem, isn't it? Some animals may risk extinction purely because they can't maintain their population because they either choose not to cross the road or if they do cross it, they die. So, one of the things that we are looking at, and this is at the moment on the N3 highway, and possibly. Um, and then we will be looking at using some of our other highways, is some of the natural structures that are already there. So you'll see some images here of under the road passages. On the left, you'll see a very large one that humans can definitely cross underneath. And then on the right, there's a very, very small one, which is a storm drain. So all these structures are there for the purpose of the road, not necessarily for wildlife. And for many of my colleagues who are listening in from Europe or North America, they will be very, very familiar with this concept because this is something that they have been working with for possibly the last 30 years. 
It's only in South Africa that we have had the opportunity to start trialing some of the work that has already been undertaken in other countries. So what we're interested in is these passages that go in underneath the road, do animals actually use them? So initially with the support of N3TC, we undertook a site visit just to have a look around these structures to see if we could see any evidence of animal activity. And we certainly did find some activity. We found spore or footprints around the entrance and also within some of the structures. And if we look at this, for those of you who are familiar with the species, just have a little think if you aren't familiar where this item may have come from. This is actually a porcupine quill. So we know that porcupines are actually using some of these structures. So our initial site visit gave us an indication that animals are actually choosing to use these existing man-made structures. But it's all well and good doing a site visit and then saying, yes, we know animals are using them, but we need more evidence. Now, here's some evidence from other countries. Um, and as I said, many other countries have been using this practice for a number of years. So this is where we are learning from other people who work in this industry. This you'll see is an underpass, um, and I do apologize for not putting up the photo credit, um, where you'll see there are some deer walking underneath the road and managing to cross from one side to the other safely. This is in North Kenya, in Africa, where there is an elephant underpass. So it's quite a busy highway and you'll see that elephants are using this highway and to cross underneath it. This was as a result of initially the elephants crossing over the road and if you can imagine hitting one of these elephants you're probably really not going to survive. More examples, we've got a brown bear using the tunnels, even Livestock, we've got cows here. And we have, if we look at the height of this tunnel, it's actually quite small, it's quite low. And yet the cows are still choosing to cross. And even penguins going through a storm drain. I think this one is fantastic. And look at this one, this is an owl. That's incredible. Many of these owls would fly over the road or even what happens with owls is that they will fly onto the road where potentially rodents have been run over and killed and they will scavenge on the road. So this is really interesting that someone has captured an owl actually flying through an underpass. So this goes back to our title of the camera traps the, that we use or we're using at the moment to get some real concrete evidence of what is going on in these underpasses. And again, this is sailing off the back of some of the studies that have been done in the Northern Hemisphere. So working with our route patrollers, you'll see on the left there, the two guys in the road safety jackets, they are part of the route patrol teams from N3. And then the guy standing on the ladder is Innocent Butelazi, who's one of the staff members at EWT, and he's fixing the camera to the wall. Now, there are many, many challenges with using camera traps in the field. Some of you who are biologists or you work in the field with um, various animal species, very often you will set your cameras up and because they're in the bush somewhere, 
you don't often have the challenges of theft. Some of you may do, but usually your camera trap is safe. Possibly the only damage that you'll face is maybe an elephant ripping the camera trap off the wall, or in some cases, hyenas like to chew on some of the camera trap boxes that are there. But for us, where we know that sometimes there's human activity, we have to make sure that this camera is very, very secure. So if we look at the image on the right here, you'll see that the camera trap is actually inside a steel box. And it's not only padlocked to um, a plate that's been drilled and screwed onto the cement concrete wall, but it's actually in the steel box, making it much more secure. So this camera trap is set up to record all animals that come through these structures. And they are effectively our eyes underneath the road. And this is where the route patrollers are fantastic in what they do. They take the memory cards from these camera traps every single day and take the memory cards, swap it with another one, so that we can have an ongoing information of what animals are using the cameras. So again, we see Innocent here showing the route patrollers how to assemble the cameras. And you'll see that some of the passages aren't always very, very friendly. The image in the middle, you'll see that they're having to wade through one of the passages that has a little bit of water in, which potentially might make it challenging for some animals to cross. And of course, we do, as I said, have to deal with human presence, which may want to try and steal some of our cameras. So what are some of the measures that we're going to in order to prevent theft? Well, and this was Innocent's idea, so I really must credit him for this. Some of these underpasses actually have swallows who will use them with their nests. So if we look here, we'll see underneath the bridge, this is a swallow nest. And so in addition to what we already have with the cameras in their steel boxes and they're padlocked with chains to the wall, we thought that possibly we could emulate or copy and make our own swallow nest, though we wouldn't be using one of the actual swallow nests, make our own swallow nest, put the camera inside and attach it to the wall. So we can see Innocent here starting work on the prototype. It's a wire structure, which he'll then cover and inside we'll place the camera. This will be an experiment. So we're not 100% sure how this is gonna work. And something else that we've thought of is very often people are deterred about being electrocuted. So the steel boxes, we've made stickers, which we've stuck to, warning people that if they touch it, they're going to get electrocuted. <laughs> so we had to think out of the box here, and excuse the pun there, um, to try and prevent the theft. And so far, we've only lost one camera, and this was prior to us looking at alternative methods, and now that we're using these alternative methods to prevent theft, we've been much more successful with our security. So what have we found so far through using our camera traps? So this is a nice image here. Again, before I tell you what they are, who can recognize them, what are they? So this is a flock of guinea fowl and they're actually heading towards the underpass. Any ideas of this one? Those of you in South Africa should be familiar. 
it's a mongoose and it's actually inside the structure and what about this one it's actually a domestic cat so even domestic species use some of these structures and look at this this is actually one of the swallows that I was talking about that use these structures naturally. You can see it sat here on the ground. And remember that porcupine quill that I showed you earlier as evidence of what is possibly using the structures? Well, here's our guy using the structure. And what's interesting and what we suspect is this guy moves back and forth every single day. So if you look at the bottom of the photograph, it actually gives us the date and the time. And as we know with many animals, they have a territory or a home range. And this porcupine, we suspect it's the same one because he then comes back about four o'clock in the afternoon. So it's nice to see that he's going back and forth in this structure and therefore safely crossing the road. And this one's really interesting. And it also gives you an idea of the challenges we sometimes face with the camera traps as in identifying what the species is. So on the left, you'll see half an image of an animal and I've made it very easy for you, for those shouting at the screen, telling me what it is. It's actually a serval cat. Now these are very, very elusive, shy, quite small cats that we have in South Africa. And sadly, on the N3 highway, we've had almost 150 killed over a three-year period. Now, what impact that is having on the actual population, we don't really know because there's not many studies done on the Servil just because they're so elusive. So hopefully through gathering some information about them using the camera traps, it might actually help us a little bit more to understand their behavior. Camera traps have also been used for other species. So I acknowledged that other countries in the world have already been doing this. This is actually a South African example. And one of my colleagues, the soon to be Dr. Bibi Linden, she has been working with some mango monkeys. And this is a species that has very, very specific areas of the country that it lives in. They're arboreal, so basically they prefer trees. And BB has been looking at what type of structure they would prefer to cross the road. And you'll see in the top images, she created some rope ladder bridges. And then at the bottom, you'll see a bamboo pole. And then you'll see in the other image that they're just sat on tree branches. Now, many of these images were actually recorded using camera traps. So it's fascinating how we can use these cameras to record animal behavior. This is an example from Australia with Dr. Kylie Sohn and Dr. Rodney van der Rey, who were studying possum to get across the road. But look what they found. In addition to possum, they were finding other animals that were actually using these structures to cross the road. And there are many other types of animal crossings. If we look at this one here, it's quite difficult to see. It's very small. But what's interesting is you'll see, despite the small structure, so this is very likely for amphibians, or small tortoise, you'll see surrounding the structure, there is this fencing. Now this is where it gets interesting because this fencing effectively prevents the animal from getting onto the road. So it's a barrier, 
and it forces them to go towards this structure and then cross the road. Here's another type of structure and you'll see these holes in the top here because many animals don't actually like going into tunnels where it's complete darkness. So if you provide a little bit of light, they'll then naturally cross the road. And then besides the underpasses, so crossing under the road, some countries have gone a stage further. And this is a little bit more expensive, but it's certainly options. These are animal overpasses. So if we look in this first example, you'll see this beautiful habitat on either side of the road and then this continuation of habitat that's a bridge. So animals can naturally move back and forth. Here's another example from Banff in North America. And this one I find fascinating. This is from Holland. And it's multiple structures. So you've got this animal overpass and look what it crosses. It crosses a waterway. Over here, there's a railway. And then further away, there's a road. But it connects the habitat. habitat. And all of these overpasses, in order for the researcher to ensure that they were working effectively, would also have had camera traps placed to see animal activity. So these are some of the options that we can explore for South Africa to make our roads safer. Safe so this is where we're heading to. These two examples are from an experiment that we tried in Northern Limpopo, where we put up this temporary barrier of road fencing and you can see this storm drain here and we recorded how many animals passed through. Now this is quite a small structure so it was only the smaller mammals, reptiles and frogs that used this storm drain. Your larger animals like an elephant would certainly not fit through there but clearly it shows that there's possibilities of using the structures that are already there. And of course, from a business model, it's very, very cost effective for the road agencies. This just shows how far the fencing extends from the side of each culvert. And these again are examples from overseas. The idea here is that once they've proved, the researchers have proved that the temporary fencing is effective, the road agency would then employ, uh, deploy more permanent fencing towards these structures. So there's a little bit of cost involved and clearly through using the cameras as our eyes, you can justify and motivate for that extra costing to make these structures usable for wildlife. And ultimately, this is a win-win because at the end of the day, we need transport. It's not about saying stop building roads, stop building railways. We need to work with the road engineers and marry that with conservation so that we come up with a win-win. Drivers are happy so that they don't get injured on roads. So it's safety improved. And our wildlife are happy because they get to cross the road safely. Now, this project is ongoing and we're still gathering road mortality data. So we still need your help to give us an understanding of what's happening across the country. So as I mentioned before, there are a number of platforms for you to record roadkill. You can use social media or email. And for those of you with smartphones, you can download our cell phone app from the Google Play Store and type in Roadwatch and then you can send us your sightings and help to be part of the project. So thank you very, very much for listening to my presentation.
I hope it's given you some insight into some of the research that we're doing. We have many, many other projects, which hopefully I'll have an opportunity to share with you. But this is generally a little bit of background about how we use camera traps to be our eyes to look at animal behavior underneath the road. And for those of you who don't get an opportunity to ask me any questions or I am, I'm unable to answer the question today because I see we have lots of questions coming up. Um, here's my email details of which you'll be able to contact me and I can talk to you directly. So thanks again for listening. Um, I'm going to go into the Q&A section now and see some of the questions. Oh, this is an interesting one. So this is from Ali Halajan. Ali says, are you recording road kills on certain roads during the lockdown? And yes, this could be a nice study to compare with before and after lockdown. Ali, that's actually a really, really interesting conversation, um, uh, valuable research question particularly on the highways where the route patrollers are still considered essential workers. So they are still out there recording road mortality data. And that's going to be a very interesting question that we will be able to answer because we already have data for before the lockdown. We'll now be able to compare that with the data that the route patrollers are still collecting and already we've noticed some very, very interesting findings. Now, do you remember earlier in this conversation that I said to you that some animals actively avoid roads because of the traffic volumes and the noise? What we've already noticed is that some animals are starting to hang around roads where they normally wouldn't. So, yes, there is still roadkill happening and we're recording it. And interestingly, there are some animals that we have never had as roadkill before, but they are attempting to cross the road. And I'm sure you've, some of you have seen some of the articles on social media, particularly those of you who live in towns and cities, that already there's a lot of urban wildlife that are starting to appear, which you've never noticed before. So it is a very, very interesting period for us, this lockdown situation. I hope that answered your question, Ali. Okay, I have another one here from Kishalin Chetty. Kishalin says, for indirect vehicle impacts, has anyone assessed if certain wildlife in game parks have experienced elevated levels of carbon monoxide in the bloodstream, i.e. big cat sightings next to the road that attract loads of cars for long periods of time. Hmm. Yeah, very relevant. Um, in this country, no. Other countries have been looking at this and mainly the carbon monoxide impact on human beings. And some people, are, some researchers are starting to look at it with regards wildlife. So we do know it's an issue. Um, it's quite challenging to actually confirm it because of course it means either darting an animal so that once it's asleep, you then take a blood sample, which we wouldn't really encourage because that's quite invasive, or waiting for an animal that's been killed on the road and taking a sample from it then. So a very interesting question. It has some challenges and I certainly believe that it definitely impacts. Okay, an another comment. Tasha Ustazen. This is a great mechanism to save our animals. However, will this not influence the landscape of fear in these animals? making the tunnels more dangerous as they are forced to go through them and predators can basically just use the tunnel as a hunting ground. 
Um, Tasha, this question has been raised many, many times in the past, certainly with the researchers that have been working in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, interestingly, and I've asked this question a number of times, from the research that's been undertaken, they found that generally there haven't, hasn't been much predation around these structures from wildlife. Some of the predation actually comes from human beings. And we know that poaching is a major problem on a global scale and often through members of the public finding out about these structures that have been set up for wildlife some people will actually be there and they are the predators who will poach some of these animals so it's it's a, a case of you working out what's best for the wildlife but again it's a challenge so thanks for that question um okay lucy uh, Thelm, are we able to know the impact of roads is the same for diurnal and nocturnal animals? Um, yes, most definitely. Um, because we have an understanding of animal behaviour already. So when you find the carcass on the road, you, you, you will know automatically whether it's a nocturnal or diurnal species. So... Um, Many uh, scrub hare, which is a uh, rabbit species that we have in South Africa, they are generally nocturnal. They are killed, they're a very common roadkill in this country, and they are nocturnal. So yes, we know that there are some pit species that are more susceptible, and it's the same with diurnal. So we, we definitely have an understanding of that. So thanks, Lucy, for that. Um, Clinton Kane, I believe that owl is actually hunting in the underpass. Yes, agreed. I would certainly support you on that, um, especially as we know that they do hunt on the roads. So it would make sense. So, yeah. Okay, Janine Stephen, could the flash perhaps have an inadvertent effect of startling the animals and changing the behaviour? Um, Yes, if you are using camera traps with flashes, but there are many, many models of camera traps out there and it's, it's all to do with your budget as a researcher. Some of the cheaper camera traps do have a flash, which will definitely impact an animal's response, but ours are infrared. So as far as we know, it's not actually changing their behavior. I hope that helps. Um, Rhiannon Gill, if animals are now using the roads more during lockdown due to less traffic volumes, do you foresee an increase in roadkill once lockdown is lifted and traffic volumes increase again? Is there a way to mitigate this? Um, Rhiannon, <laughs> short and sweet, yes. Um, I mean, it's all hypothetical and as tragic as the situation we are in regarding the COVID-19 virus, this provides us with a once in a lifetime opportunity to gather this data. And personally, I would foresee an incre increase in roadkill once the lockdown is suspended because these animals would have got used to the road and attempt a crossing. Um, what would be interesting is whether they still continue to try and cross the road or whether they revert back to their previous behaviour of avoiding the road. And ways to mitigate this, well, effectively it is looking at the use of the underpasses and trying to force them to use this. Um, other things that we can look at is deploying sound barriers, which have been used in other countries effectively. So to prevent this um, impact of traffic noise, you can put up sound barriers so that there's no fear of crossing the road and then the sound barrier, in addition to the fencing, will 
force them underneath the road. Um, I think we're almost drawing to the end of some of the questions. Um, I think we might be running out of time. And I see there's lots and lots of questions here. So I'm really apologizing for not being able to get to them. Um, Michelle Watson, I'm sure you will mention in your presentation, but I'm interested to know the cost and availability of camera traps. Is there any way to rent them for specific projects? <laughs> Interesting question, Michelle. That's the million dollar question as well. Um, <laughs> they, they do vary in cost and that does depend on your budget for a project and also the type of camera. Um, somebody mentioned that there was one of the questions earlier about the use of a flash changing animal behavior. So the ones with the flash are generally less expensive. Um, you can also have some cameras that have videos. They're obviously going to be expensive. Um, the cameras that we actually used, we managed to get a grant to purchase them and we had them sent over from the United States. But the price really does vary. With regards renting them, um, depending if you are in collaboration with a university, the university may actually support your project to help you. But I'm more than prepared to discuss this offline with you, Michelle, um, because I think this is quite a long um, answer and certainly with the costing. And also, I don't want to use this as a PR event by saying which cameras are better than others. Um, okay. All right, I think this might be the last question. And then the rest of you, I, you can see my email on the left there, I hope. Please um, email me your questions. All right, so this is Kathy Balston. So Kathy says, the amount of roadkill in the Kruger seems to be on the rise. Is that correct? And do you think better driver education briefing on arrival at the park would help? Oh, Kathy, this is, um, this is a whole new presentation. So I hope I have the opportunity to present on this because I've got so much to say. We have actually been working with South African National Parks or Sand Parks to look at how we do reduce roadkill in the protected areas and how we go about changing driver behaviour. And we've embarked on a five year project. We've already published one paper and Innocent Lutelazy and Brilliant Macheo, who are two students of mine, had gathered some fantastic or done some fantastic research in Kruger regarding this, and they are writing it up as their thesis, which I hope we'll, we'll publish. But most definitely, it's all about making drivers aware, certainly at the gate entrances, but this is something that we're working on with Kruger and many of the other parks, and they are taking it very, very seriously. So, I think that kind of ties up my presentation. Again, apologies for those who I didn't get to answer your questions. I see there's quite a substantial amount. Please contact me by email. And I really hope to talk to many of you again. And stay safe, look after yourselves. And certainly when the lockdown has been lifted, stay safe on the roads. Thank you.